Well, good morning, First Family Church. Uh, it is great to be with you guys, man. God is, whoa, we're going to be preaching from memory. Uh, God is gracious to, to have this weather. And um, my name is Stan Hayek, Next Gen Director here on staff. And um, man, it's fun to kind of culminate our VBS, oh, we're good there, uh, our VBS week uh, with an outdoor service like this and celebrate and just take time to just break from the normal cadence and, and let it be as special as it is. And as you heard Becky uh, talking, uh, we had over 250 students here. It takes a lot of volunteers to be able to do something like that on, a, on that scale. And we're just so grateful if you're one of those and the light blue shirts all week, loving on those kids, be it crafts and, and games or uh, leaders. Thank you so much. Uh, for being a part of that. Um, yeah, you can give him a hand. Yeah. Tell you, there's nothing that'll help you appreciate those kids workers than being one of them for a week. And you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus, that we have people that that see this ministry opportunity. And so we're grateful. Uh, just some personal highlights from the week. Uh, I getting to hear one story uh, in particular about a young gal getting saved this week, trusting Jesus and knowing that her family had been praying for her and uh, to see that kind of come to culminate. And I really do hope that in the days ahead, you're going to see students getting baptized and they're going to look back at VBS and say, that's where God saved me. That's where God got a hold of me. And not only is God working in them, he's working through them. We've got a, a couple, it's a, it's a family in our church, the McConnells, that are getting ready to go off to training before they go overseas. And the students wanted to help out. And so this year, the VBS offering went to the McConnells, challenged, you call them kids, children, to raise $10,000 to help this uh, family go. It was gonna be for transportation, their tuition for the training, and then some tacos, aka food. Uh, but where the training's at, tacos made sense, so it worked. Challenge the kids. Two days in, y'all, we had to adjust the goal because they had already hit $10,000. They finished with just over $16,000 that they gave, yeah. It's just crazy, and, and, and to know this is coming from students. Well, I, I know one high school student in particular so moved that they gave $1,000 out of their savings, large portion of their savings, to help that family um, go take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so it's fun to be the next-gen guy, kind of working with a great team of people in the next generation. And so um, just celebrating today. Uh, but we're going to continue our series in First Peter. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your, your journals, we're going to be in First Peter chapter 3. And it's be on the screens as well. It's a little bit shorter sermon today. One, I thought it was going to be a little bit hotter. Uh, so trying to help you all out. And two, we've got a number of baptisms today that we're going to end the service with. But as you open to 1 Peter, here's your title of the sermon, which is also your take-home truth. And I built it for, for simple rednecks like myself. You might not even need to write it down. It's this. Bless when bruised. Bless when bruised. And now if you have a, a high justice bone and you think, bless when bruised, that, that doesn't seem like very just. Uh, man, and it comes from verse nine, and we're gonna do eight through 12, but verse nine says this, do not repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. And that instantly probably brings about a conflict in you because you're the text is seemingly telling us to embrace a level of, of injustice. Like that's not right, that's unjust, that somebody would do evil and that, that there wouldn't be consequences, but on the contrary, you're actually called to bless. And there's a tension because you're right, justice is a really good thing. We have a just God and we are to fight for justice. But the tension is, the text is now calling us to seemingly in that injustice to, to bless. And I believe that God's word will resolve that tension as we study today. And so I'm gonna... Um, Dive into verse eight. It says this. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. In one verse, you can 
He's going to tell us to be five things. Did you catch it? Be about these five things. He's saying all of you should be these things. What is the first one? He says, you should have a unity of minds. Now, there's some misconception on that, what that means. Sometimes we think of conformity. It's like we all have to think the same thing and do the same thing. That's conformity. That's not unity. Unity of mind is where we can have different preferences. We can perhaps disagree on certain things, but we agree on the main thing, which is Jesus. And because we agree on Jesus and we major on the majors and let the minor things be the minor things, we can have unity of mind. He's saying we should have unity of mind. I'd say it like this. If, if you're the kind of person that's willing to die on every hill, die on the hill of vaccination, die on the hill of, of how you should school and which party you should, if you're willing to die on every hill, you will be unable to find unity of mind that he's talking about here. You'll be too busy dying to be able to live with anybody. Amen? So if you're willing to die on every hill, you're not going to have unity of mind. That's just one. He's got more. He's saying you ought to be the kind of people that are sympathetic. Feel what others feel. Now, those that are sympathetic, that are good with sympathy, don't say, hey, I know how you feel. Sympathy doesn't talk much. It listens much. I'm trying not to get emotional on this part. This past two days was actually back at our family farm in Tama. It was 20 years ago on Father's Day that my dad passed away in a, tra a tragic accident on the farm. He's 44 years old. And I think about the time uh, as we kind of remember the anniversary of my dad's passing, just remembering those that showed sympathy. That is, that the, the just showed us kindness by simply being present when our family needed it and just being a listening ear. And 20 years later, as my siblings and I remembered my dad, we could not help but remember how God was kind to us through those that just simply showed sympathy, being present. He's going to say, that's the kind of people you should be. You should have a unity of mind. You should be the kind of people that are present with people, that listen, show sympathy. He goes on to say, you should be the kind of people that embody this brotherly love. Some of you are like, I had brothers. I don't know if that's the kind of love God would call us to. No, not that kind of love, but this brotherly love, or, or another way to be say, like a family kind of love. That family kind of love where you can have disagreements, you can have squabbles, but at the end of the day, you're family. And there's this brotherly love that's like, yeah, I love my sibling enough to tell them when they're wrong, but I will love my sibling enough, my family enough, where we'll defend each other. Some of you don't know that kind of family love. Perhaps your family has conditional love. Conditions were met, now you guys don't talk. I'm sorry about that. That's not what he has in mind here. He says a family kind of love. That's what you're to be about. Unity of mind, sympathetic, this resilient family love. He goes on to say the next one have a tender heart. The Greek there, they're, they're trying to capture something like, in another translation might be like a good belly, like at the core, like what's inside of you is just goodness. Hypocrisy is this ability to have an outer shell that looks good, but at the, the inside is just rottenness and selfishness. He say, no, at the, the core, there needs to be just a, a selflessness. This is a little bit hard because I feel like we are kind of accustomed to having more transactional relationships. Like these transactional relationships where it's like, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. And at the core, sometimes like the outer thing can look like, oh, you're doing some good things. But at the core, it's really just a selfishness. But he's saying at the core, you need to just have a good belly. I was challenged in small group this week we were talking about this text and there's a guy, Matt, who grew up in a different country, just a different culture. And he talks about being a high school guy going out to a restaurant with his friends. And this is something like where they would go do some, some fun kind of activity. And it came time to, to pay the bill. 
Now, some of you, like the high school students, you're like, this is why I take math class, because now we got to figure out how to divide the bill and, and figure out a tip and what, what, what's a good tip. Matt would say, like, the culture where they grew up, whoever was close would just grab the bill and they would be the ones that would pay it. And I'm like, well, this is foreign. You got to help. You're in a foreign country. Help me. That's a foreign mindset. Matt said it like this so nonchalantly. He's just like, we're lifelong friends. And so there wasn't uh, any, like, it was all going to work out in the end. We're going to be lifelong friends. So there's no point in kind of trying to, to keep track. And moreover, friends don't do that. I'm like, man, you're speaking a foreign language, but I think you captured the text that at the, the core of who we're called to be is just selfless, tenderhearted, good to the core, not motivated by gain, but just by motivated by Christ-likeness. He goes on to say you ought to be humble, have this humble mind, this lowly posture. And that comes from recognizing a dependence on God. We can have humility. It's, it's not thinking uh, you know, less of ourselves, but thinking of ourself less is perhaps how you've heard that described is, is humility. It's like, I'm going to take a low position before a holy and righteous God. Now, we're one verse in and he's given us five things to be about. And perhaps you're already, I could spend the rest of the sermon just unpacking any one of those for us, right? And it starts to feel like in your potluck plate here in about 20 minutes, that's starting to be overflowing and we haven't even gotten to the dessert table yet, okay? I feel like when I was studying this a little bit of max capacity, and he's saying, this is who you're to be. And then he's gonna go on in verse nine and say, no, we're not done yet. He's saying, now I need you to, to do things with that. This is what I want you to do. In verse nine, he says, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this is what you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. This idea that when we are bruised, that being when people revile us, by definition, that'd just be this criticizing in an abusive, anger, insulting kind of manner. When people revile you, perhaps you've been reviled. When people are evil to you, when they do wrong to you, we've had that happen. What he's saying is, bless when bruised. When they treat you like that, don't repay it. But on the contrary, I love it. He's like, this is contrary. Bless. And you might be thinking, that does not come natural. That's the point. It's supernatural. And so when we respond to that evil and with blessing, it points people to a supernatural God. Because what is natural is, hey, you bruise me. I'm going to bop you. <laughs> like, like, you bruise me. Like, it's not going to go well. And so this, you get this eye for an eye sort of deal. That's justice, right? Eye for an eye. Like, you do that, I'm going to do this, which just perpetuates further dysfunction. And so it's like the Hatfield and McCoy's feud. It just goes round and round and round. And in marriage, we call it, this is like the crazy cycle. Like you do something. Who started it? We don't know. But somewhere you're in this spiral and it just keeps spiraling and he, somebody's got to break it. But it's understandable because we want justice. You know how I know this is, any of you that have driven very much, been on the interstate, and you've had that car come flying by you recklessly, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you're kind of going at least the speed limit, and they come buzzing by you, whipping through traffic. How good does it feel when you get two miles down the road, and you see that, uh, you see that car pulled over? Yeah, you're laughing. You're like, it feels really good. Yeah, because you're like, justice is being served. Don't let them off with a warning. Give them the full thing. I think their blinkers out. No, like you just want justice, right? Justice. And, and I'm I, when I read scripture and I see Jesus bringing justice in the temple. If you can remember this in Jerusalem, this is where people were supposed to go to meet with God. In the temple, they would make sacrifices. They would pray and what the temple had become in Jesus's day, the religious, religious leaders saw an opportunity for gain. And so when people would come and they would bring their lamb to sacrifice, to make atonement to God, the religious leaders would look at that lamb and say, mm, that lamb, that lamb's not good enough actually. 
God couldn't accept that. You can't sacrifice that lamb. You actually need to buy one of ours. Well, the price, <laughs> it'll cost you. But you want to be right with God, don't you? Oh, the, the money you're going to use to buy that lamb? That, where'd you get that money? That's not from around here. You need to go see my cousin over there and exchange that money. Yeah, you take a little bit. You know, it's, it's business, right? Jesus walks into that environment, sees what's happening in his father's house where people were supposed to meet with God and there was a barrier being placed there by religious leaders. And I love this scripture. It's just, Jesus sees what's happening. He makes a whip. He doesn't find a whip. He braids one together himself, takes it and starts driving out the animals, driving out the people, overturning the tables. And if you got a justice bone in your body, when you read that, you're like, woohoo, get him, right? Like this justice right now. And I just, I love justice. And I think we should, because justice is a godly thing. God is a just God. And we're right to be unsettled by injustice or even a righteous anger towards injustice. We're about justice and and it's a good quality, but here's the problem. The problem is not a high view of justice. The problem is our inconsistency with it. What we say in our inconsistency is, give them justice, give me grace. Therein lies the problem, is our inconsistency with justice. We love a just God when it's him dealing with somebody else's sin, but as for ours, oh, <laughs> grace. You know, officer, I was a little bit late. They're the one. Inconsistency. And that is oftentimes the reasoning behind this victim mentality that has just become pervasive in our culture. This victim mentality that, that says, oh, I'm just an innocent victim. I didn't do anything. It's the villain over there that's wronging me. We're even just talking in our church staff about how that can creep into our language where we say things like, well, I didn't know. Nobody told me. In other words, I'm innocent. You're guilty. You had an obligation to communicate something. You didn't do it. And it's this point in his finger. It's this victim mentality. And it becomes from this inconsistency where we say, no grace for them, only grace for us. I would say this, uh, with, with the greater the inconsistency, or, or I'd say like this, the, the louder is a a person is with the sins of others, perhaps the more blind they are to their own. Matthew 7 would tell us, do not be surprised how well people can see past a log in their own eye to see the speck in yours. The louder people are typically with the sins of the others, of others, the more oblivious they are to their own. If you're one that says, man, our culture is just so bankrupt and so jacked up and so everything about our culture, you live in the culture. <laughs> like you might be the kind of jacked up person that Jesus needed to die for. Man, I, I'm all about calling a spade a spade, justice being just, but be consistent with it. There's a level of, of brokenness when we say, hey, to them justice, but to us grace. I would say this, Christian, their actions may be unjust. They may deserve consequences, but your sin rightly deserves hell, Romans 6.23. Scriptural truth won't allow us to live in this victim mentality. None of us are innocent. Jesus Christ had to go to the cross for all of us, for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. So when we see our sinful actions, our sinful thoughts, our sinful attitudes for the evil that they are, Perhaps then we can begin to embrace the grace Christ has for us and show grace to others. Because the reality is if we got what we deserved, it'd be hell. And so therefore it's the height of hypocrisy to say, God, give me grace, but give them justice. And he would say in our text, if, if we've been the recipients of grace, then we give grace. All that we're called to be in verse eight, all that we're called to, to do, verse nine and the following is got to be rooted in our identity. When we held deserving sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God, who deserve death to be eternally separated from God. When God seeing us 
dead in our sins, sent Christ to die on the cross for our sins, allowed the Holy Spirit to allow us to feel conviction, to repent of those sins. You say in Ephesians 2, it's by grace that we've been saved through faith, not by works. When we confess Jesus with our mouth and believe that God raised him from the dead, we can be saved. And so all that we're called to be and all we're called to do is rooted in our identity, meaning this, that when we remember the cross, we can remember that Jesus, when he's calling us in the, in the word today to bless those who do evil, Jesus is not asking us to do anything he hasn't already done. When he was nailed to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus was crucified and blessed. Surely when we are bruised, we can bless. What's happening here is, is our vertical relationship with the Lord must be consistent with our horizontal relationship with others. And so if our vertical relationship with the Lord is marked by God's mercy, his grace, his patience, his compassion, our horizontal relationships ought to be marked by those same things. That's why Jesus said, hey, when you pray, you're gonna say, hey, Father, forgive us as we forgive others. Those must be consistent, what is happening vertically and what's happening horizontally. And he goes on to say that not only with this instruction about blessing, he goes on, there's a little bit of, of a promise in there that he says, when this is what you were called to, that you may obtain, or your version might say, inherit a blessing. Well, what does he mean by that? Uh, this obtain or inherit a blessing. I also say he's talking about eternal life. Now, I can tell you for sure what it doesn't mean. <laughs> what it does not mean in light of this whole context of the book is, hey, if you don't do well at blessing others who do evil, like if you don't do well, you're not gonna get into heaven or moreover, like you can lose your spot in heaven unless you're good at this. He can't mean that because in verse uh, chapter one of first Peter, he's saying it's through Jesus we're saved alone. Our salvation is secured by God himself. And so he's not saying that this blessing earns us a spot in inheritance in, in heaven. So perhaps a better way to read it would be, yeah, he's talking about eternal life, but what he's saying is because you've been called, that is adopted into God's family through Jesus, one day we will join God in heaven. This blessing is one we inherit, not one we earn. And I think that's a very valid interpretation. I also think others would say it, it could mean this, that you've been adopted yet called into the family and the family of God, the blessers. That's our identity. And our dad, our heavenly father is the best blesser of them all. And he seeks to bless blessers right now. To bless those that are blessed, he wants to bless them right now. And yeah, and when, they, when we go to meet with him, we're gonna be blessed with this inheritance called eternal life. And because we're a part of the family of blessers and, and our dad's the best blesser of all, not only do we get heaven, but there's rewards that can be stored up based on our actions now. And I think the, the, the following verses would support that interpretation. That it is just a one-time blessing, but there's blessings to be had because he's gonna go on to say, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, there's, there's promise, there's blessing right now. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. We're a family of blessers and we bless even when others bruise us. And the, way, the reason we can live like that is this, that our confidence in our future glory is manifested today through holy living. If you believe this text, if you believe that God is a generous God who blesses us not only with salvation, but Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and life abundantly. If you believe that, your confidence in that 
It will be manifested today through how you live, how you carry yourself, the words you speak, the things you do. If that is our identity, it will flow through us. And the same generous spirit that the Father has towards us, we will have with others. That is why what we, what we, who we are and what we do has to be rooted in our identity. This isn't done by willpower, it's done out of the overflow as we remember what God has done for us. That we were brought into the family because when Jesus was crucified, he blessed, breaking the curse of sin and death. And so we stay consistent. That which we receive from God, we freely pass on to others.